Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so thank you all very much for coming, and welcome to everyone and to our distinguished guests and speakers. I'm so happy to see such a great turnout here. I'd like to acknowledge the sponsorship, our generous sponsorship from the National Science Foundation, a grant that was uh, submitted by Dan Bernstein. It's allowed us to support many students to attend this conference. Uh, generous sponsorship of CERTICOM to uh, sponsor the dinner for the conference. We have um, received sponsorship from PIMS, Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences, to help support many people to come, and the generous support of Microsoft Research, which has been providing the facilities and um, much of the food for the conference. So um, with that, I'd like to say, obviously, we're here to celebrate the 25th 25th year anniversary of elliptic curve cryptography and many related and relevant elliptic curve algorithms. Um, so for that reason, we've doubled the length of the usual ECC conference, which is usually an annual conference, which is 2.5 days, and instead we're having five days of talks. And we've devoted the entire first day as a celebration of the 25th year anniversary. Um, so today we'll have talks commemorating um, the Invention of Elliptic Curve Cryptography, talks by Victor Miller and Neil Koblitz, co-inventors of ECC, talks by um, Francois Morin and um, Goldwasser, who are pioneers of the ECPP elliptic curve primality proving algorithm, Renee Scoff, who found the first polynomial time algorithm for counting points on an elliptic curve, and Gerhard Frey, famous for many contributions and attacks in elliptic curve and hyperelliptic curve cryptography, um, among which is the Frey curve, which played a starring role in the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Um, later in the week, we will have a talk about ECM, the elliptic curve factoring method, by Peter Montgomery, who's also celebrating around this time roughly 25-year anniversary of Montgomery multiplication. And um, we'll be speaking about new work on elliptic curve uh, factoring method at the end of the conference. So um, just for context, we're celebrating 25 years uh, anniversary of elliptic curve cryptography. Microsoft Research has only been around for almost 20 years. We're about to celebrate 20 year anniversary next year. So we're relatively young compared to the elliptic curve uh, progress. A few years ago, 25, 25th year anniversary of LLL was celebrated. RSA is roughly 35 years old, if I did my subtraction right. So um, today, after a fantastic day of talks, we'll have the re reception and the rump session, including honoring Scott Vanstone for his pioneering role in advocating for widespread adoption of ECC. And in the intervening 25 years, we've seen ECC transition from being an abstract idea to being a practical and valuable technology, which is currently deployed across the computer industry. Um, so this is quite an accomplishment to celebrate. And ECC has expanded and been extended to include pairing-based cryptography, which has also enabled many new cryptographic functionalities and become practical very quickly, and hyperliptic curve cryptography, which holds out promise for the future. You can, have your, you can form your own opinion about how practical it, it is for the present. So I welcome you to what I think will be a great week of, of talks and a very fun conference. And I'd like to start our first talk is going to be given by Gerhard Frey, professor from University of Essen. And he will talk about elliptic curves, facts, conjectures, and applications. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank very, very much all the organizers, uh, which made it possible that I could come here. And of course, it's great for me to see all the people again. Uh, I have met you in the last 25 years and longer. And uh, I was uh, kind of active in the ECC workshops uh, from the beginning on. 
and uh, I would say it's very appropriate that uh, Scott Vanston is specially honored today for without him uh, this beautiful series of conferences would not exist. And of course I'm very happy to see all the active actors of ECC and beyond ECC here. And so I am, um, and, and they will give talks. And uh, many others who are new in the business will give talks. So I'm a little bit impressed. What should I tell you? And so one of the members of a, a program committee said, give an introductory talk. So in fact, I will not give an introductory talk, but a pre introductory talk. Most of my talk will be from a time before 85. And not much, uh, not the major part will be uh, applied in cryptography. But nevertheless, I think uh, our family being here will uh, feel at home in the kind of mathematics I want to uh, present here. And if you are bored, there are next uh, uh, lectures to come. So, Uh, there are problems we would like to solve. Uh, for instance, Kornegger's Jugendraum. Uh, please give a recipe to generate all a billion varieties of a given number field by adjoining very explicit elements coming from, let's say, transcendental functions, special values. Or today beyond, Langland said, why do you restrict to a billion extensions? Look at all Galois representations of every dimension and try to find objects which finally give you this whole bunch of fields in an explicit way. A uh, number theorist in daily life would like to decide whether a given number is a prime number. Or if not, uh, what are the factors? And of course, we know how to do it. It's an effective algorithm to try. But it should be fast. And finally now, this is 1976, I think. Uh, Diffie Hellman's demand, please give a discrete log system. It means give a cyclic group in which you can uh, present elements in a compact way, do addition in a very compact way and fast way, but the inverse, the discrete lock, is not feasible in practical time. These are challenges and we are far away from having solutions for these, but there is some progress. So let me go uh, in the big first part to history and every good history in number theory should begin with Gauss. And this is nine times 25 years ago when he invented his first theorems, but when it goes on and on of course. And you all know his achievements. Uh, we would not be uh, in the state uh, uh, in which we are without his groundbreaking work. Uh, but maybe it's not so well known that he is the first one who does arithmetic geometry. He really is looking for function fields over finite fields and gives the first non-trivial example of Riemann hypothesis. This is the chapter 7 of Disquisitiones, uh, which is not so well known. And there is a very nice uh, uh, article of Günther Frey about this uh, chapter. Then, We have Jacobi and uh, seven times 25 years ago. Uh, by the way, Gauss uh, did uh, already uh, introduce the name index for uh, the power you need to go from one root of unity to another one modulo some p. And Jacobi was fascinated and did algorithmic work. He gave a table of indices for uh, primes uh, smaller than 1,000 and all numbers between 1 and uh, 100. 
five times times 25 years ago, at least it is plus minus one year, uh, Kronecker stated his Jugendraum. I already have mentioned this. And then, yet at the same time, the same period, Frobenius proved what is usually needed about the density theorem of Chapitaryov, which came uh, quite uh, later, but not so late, 1922. About three times 25 years ago, the big, big work of Emmy Noether was, I think this was kind of a beginning of a systematic study of ideal classes, ideals, and so on in Noetherian rings. And it is interesting that a student of hers, Greta Hermann, studied the things from a uh, uh, algorithmically point of view and proved that arithmetic in Picard groups 10 can be done effectively. Okay, now 50 years ago we have an explosion. Of course one has to mention Grotendieck introducing schemes, introducing cohomology, and giving us a totally new side of what arithmetic geometry should be, unifying number theory and geometry. Tate stated his duality theorems, published. That's uh, something rare about him. Neron and Tate developed the theory of heights, and especially Neron showed that a height is a geometric concept Loc it's, it's done by intersection theory locally and then you put down uh, together the local contributions to get the global height. And uh, it's not, uh, not so easy to give an exact date. Eichler and Shimura developed this very, very fundamental concept that Hecke operators, which have to do with transcendental objects, have to do with Galois theory, the traces correspond to traces of Frobenius elements. And this eichler shimura uh, uh, congruence gives you really the connection between number theory and the analytic theory of modular forms. Burgeons, Winner, and Dyer. We have a pioneer here. Uh, published, I think, 63, 65. Uh, very, very keen speculations based on maybe the first massive computations uh, on a computer. Let me say that elliptic, the arithmetic of elliptic curves over maybe Q or over number fields can be described analogously to class groups of number fields, but not analogously. There are new things coming up. And out came the very, very uh, groundbreaking conjecture of Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer, which is now one of the most seminal concepts in arithmetic geometry, generalized wider and wider. And uh, today we speak about special values of L series attached to motifs which have, should have an arithmetic meaning. Then, Tate Sato conjecture came up, independently discovered by Tate and by Sato. I will come to this. And a refinement, kind of refinement, was given by Lang and Trotter. This is not in the grid of 25 years, it is a little bit later. Anyway, we had now all the ingredients to enter into a golden age. Uh, I would say of mathematics, but some people say of arithmetic geometry. <laughs> Depends on the point of view. And uh, number theory did not vanish, but number theory was interpreted many, many times and very fruitfully by looking at geometric objects and uh, trying to combine both concepts. It is not true that you uh, just do geometry and then number theory, uh, uh, theorems plop out. 
or you do number theory and then you get geometrical things. But both sides have to do together and because of Kuhn-Dieck, we are used to look at these things in a unified way. So, what is a geometric player? The simplest one. It's a cubic with a cusp. And looking at this uh, transformation, you see easily that you have an isomorphism between the usual additive line, a fine line with usual addition, and the points on the cubic curve, which is projective. But one point is not regular, and you have to take it away. So if you do not go to this one point, you have an addition law. Just try to find it out what is the addition law. You know addition in the field, try to find what is the addition on this cubic. Taking two points away, you come to a node. You take two points away and then you melt it again in a node with two different tangent lines. And what you get is y square z plus x y z equal to x cube. You have a parameterization uh, of any element u going to this thing, special definition for the point one. Here you have problem with one, but when you say, okay, this is infinity. So the point zero point one. On, by this method, you get a, 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 an isomorphism between the multiplicative group as a scheme and the regular points of this projective cubic. Again, write down the addition laws. This is now a part of geometry which lies behind the multiplicative group of fields and with this quite a lot of results were obtained already. For instance, uh, the Jugendraum of Kronecker over the rational numbers. You can realize every abelian extension of rational numbers, Q, by adjoining roots of unity. And these are just values of the exponential functions, uh, e power 2 pi i x at rational numbers. Okay? Characters were studied successfully and as a spectacular result of his theory, Kummer established the criterion that the Fermat-Lath theorem is true for exponents which are regular primes. Unfortunately, uh, there are infinitely many non-regular primes. And uh, I do not know the state of the art. I think one, uh, one, one knows what should be the part of regular ones, but one cannot prove it till now. So, we get results by this multi very easy multiplicative theory, but not everything what we want. Factoring of numbers and prime numbers test used for multiplicative group of finite fields. And this is very, uh, very, 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 very nice results which come out, but we are not as good as we would like to have it. And finally, Diffie-Hellman question could be answered in a not so bad way. But already in 1922, I think this was not, uh, people were not aware about this in 76, uh, Greitschik gives an index calculus algorithm. And this uh, index calculus algorithm makes it clear that the security, the hardness of a discrete log in the multiplicative group is sub-exponential without all the constants uh, which we know today. But in principle, we have already this, this algorithm in 1922. Why do we not get all what we want? One thing is uh, if we use uh, our affine curves in P1, one finds essentially only two curves. Namely, the one with, an, uh, with a cusp, the additive group, which is good in characteristic P, but nearly worthless in characteristic zero, and the multiplicative group. And there are twists. 
So you get tori, which are not split. But that's it. Oh. Secondly, if you look at the multiplicative group, then the number of points is very, very, very rich. Look at the multiplicative group of Q. It's an exercise in the first class of number theory, I think, to prove that Q is a Z, Q star is a Z module not finally generated. So it's a very, very big group. And, but it has lots and lots of finitely generated free subgroups. Take any set of primes and take the numbers which are powers of this set of primes and you have a free Z module and this leads to the concept of smooth numbers. So there are many, many subgroups which consist of smooth numbers. A small deformation changes the world. What are you doing? Just write instead of y square z equal to x cube, write y square plus xy. Uh, now here plus uh, y square z equal to x cube plus z power 3. Plot the function and what you see is the singularity vanishes. You have now a cubic without singularity. Or take the other example. <coughs> Just write instead of y square z plus x y z equal to x cube, again this one additional term z power 3. And again you see the singular point vanishes. So you make a small deformation of your, of, your, of your cubic with a singular point and of course then you get something without a singularity. So you get a cubic without a singularity. But remember that we had an addition on the cubic with singularity. Now it is very easy and uh, uh, I think everyone uh, believes it that if you change a little bit and do the same changed addition, you get again a group law. And in fact, you just, you have solved now all uh, the exercises. You saw the addition law uh, where it's always taking two points, taking a line through the two points, you have a third intersection. Maybe you have to take a reflection. Then the sum of these three points you get is equal to the neutral element. And you do just the same on the elliptic curve. And what you get is the addition law. Now this is a strange uh, introduction of the addition law on elliptic curves. Usually one does it conversely. Beginning with an elliptic curve, one shows that this is an addition law. And then one says there are some degenerations. And of course, on the degenerations, the addition law is the same. Anyway, we have this addition law. And we have one immense, immensely. These elliptic curves are now projective. So where we can do addition is in a projective. And this projective always means compact area. And there are many non-isomorphic elliptic curves. I mean, just one uh, deformation. You can make many deformations, and you always get uh, curves. Uh, in fact, if you want to classify elliptic curves, you all know this, you just need one number, the absolute J invariant, GA, to classify the isomorphism class of elliptic curve of algebraically closed fields. And if you are over a non-algebraically closed field, you have to take an additional character, usually a quadratic one, a twist character. And the converse is true too. I think this was an observation of Hasse that uh, T given any uh, j, you find an elliptic curve with j invariant, and then you find all the other twist companions by, by twisting. Uh, it is uh, kind of strange that the abstract concept of elliptic curves is a rather late one. Uh, maybe Beppo Levi was the first one who really did this in earnest, so 1910, 20. 
And Hasse did it in earnest with, uh, in combination with F.K. Schmidt and such people. And uh, so we have now this theorem. Uh, so we have many, many isomorphic classes of elliptic curves. Roughly speaking, as many as elements in the field Kr. And uh, then uh, addition law. First of all, presentation of a curve uh, can be given, and this is a, a result uh, using riemann roch by a very specific way of cubic curves, namely by a Weierstrass equation. And sometimes, if you are not in characteristic two or three, you even can make these three coefficients zero, and then you have the short Weierstrass equation. And conversely, having such a projective plane curve, you only have to make sure that it has no singularities when you have an elliptic curve. This means, by definition, a curve of genus 1 defined over the field K with a rational point or a function field language with a prime divisor of degree 1. And when you use Riemann-Rochon, you come to an equation like that. And what happens if you have a discriminant equal to zero, that means singular points, then there can be at most one, there can be at most one singular point, at least after maybe a quadratic extension, you find it. And this is when you come back to the, gym, uh, to the GA, the additive group, and the multiplicative group. So they just occur as degenerations, and this were only degeneration. Addition laws, again an exercise. I gave it geometrically, you write it down and you all know this, so I have not to go into this detail. These are simple formulas, but nevertheless, now this is uh, because of cryptography maybe, uh, you want to have this addition as efficient as possible. Uh, so first of all, you transform and transform till you have a very efficient addition law in, for Weierstrass equation. But when you see maybe other curves are much better, for instance, taking Legendre normal form or intersections of two quadrics, which is from a theoretical, theoretical point of view sometimes very useful, or take the Hessian forms, you need some conditions on points of order three, or taking Edwards curves. And these are now quartics. So we go up with the exponent, but when we have to pay, we have a singular point. The big advantage is that as long as this singular point uh, does not, uh, yeah, it corresponds to two points, and if these two points are not rational, you can be sure that the remaining a fine part has an addition law. The fine part, that's a big advantage. Having now our elliptic curves, we come to the key, namely we look at points of order n, the points E n. And one knows about the structure. Uh, if n is a power of a characteristic of the fields, then uh, the points of order P power s are either only trivial or z mod p power s, and the two cases are distinguished between to say a is a super singular or a is ordinary. But if we are away from a characteristic of a field, then we know that uh, this uh, group scheme is isomorphic as a Belian group to z mod n mod, uh, across z mod n, but it has a Galois action on it. And this means that we have a Galois representation rho E n in, induced by the action of a Galois group on the points of order n. And a little bit more general, go to the projective limit, you get the uh, Tate module of elliptic curve, and uh, this is a free ZL module of rank 2. You have a continuous action of the Galois group of Q with respect to the profile topology, and you get a very, very important two-dimensional analytic representation rho to the EL. If we want to see this from a high pro point of view, is we introduce a large cohomology and we let the Galva group operating on the first uh, uh, Z, uh, ZL cohomology of our elliptic curve. And of course, this is just 
a special case of a general case of abelian varieties. But I am speaking here about elliptic curves, so experts should uh, do the entertaining uh, uh, thing and always think about abelian varieties instead of elliptic curves. Okay, this has already uh, very nice uh, consequences, namely we can describe uh, the uh, ring of endomorphisms of elliptic curves if we tensor by Q, forget this T, then this is a skew field since we have a simple abelian variety and it uh, lies into GL2ZL because of the dimension of the module and so we get that this is either Q or a quadratic field or a quaternion field. There are no other possibilities for the uh, endomorphisms of elliptic curve tensorized with Q. Has this to do something with rational curves? Yes, it has. L come back to GM, look at the Galois representation induced by the action of a Galois group of roots of unity. We get the cyclotomic character, and this cyclotomic character is the determinant of the representation we get in, uh, from the elliptic curves. And behind this is already the duality of abelian varieties or elliptic curves and restricted to uh, torsion points, it's the veil pairing which tells us that this is true. It, it, it's especially we have that this representation is an odd representation. So if we look at, uh, at, at, the complex, at a complex conjugation uh, and take the representation, look at the determinant when it's minus one come to this later maybe. Here it is. Having with points of order n, we can introduce level n structures. We just take a trivialization of, uh, uh, of, of, of our scheme. We map it to z mod n cross z mod n. So we forget the Galois structure. We just go to the abelian group structure. And when we have a moduli problem, there are many such isomorphisms. Please classify them together with elliptic curve. There's a moduli <coughs> problem and it is representable and it is even a fine moduli problem and it's even defined over z when this curve there is n will not be connected but if you want to have it connected you add the nth root of unity and then you get the modular curve x of n. Classifying elliptic curves together with a specific isomorphism to Zn cross Zn. Okay, there are subcovers. Look at orbits of these uh, uh, level structures. First one is x1 of n, there you want to have an elliptic curve together with a specific point of order n. Take this as first uh, uh, vector uh, in a base and then let the other one vary and then you get presentations 1, 0, star, star and this gives you the curve x1 of n and if you do not want to have a fixed point but just a group generated by this fixed point you get x0 of n classifying elliptic curves together with isogenies of which are cyclic and have a kernel which is equal to a cyclic group of order n. So we have modular forms and so elliptic curves create modular forms and create x0 and x1 n. On the other side we can look at elliptic curves which are quotients of these curves. This happens sometime and so elliptic curves create elliptic curves. And this is the conjecture of Tani Yamashimura over the rational numbers. I will come to that. I have to introduce some concepts of Galois theory. Uh, you know, over number fields, we have a uh, uh, hierarchy. We begin with a global field. When we have many valuations, we give topologies. Uh, we look at the completions of our field with respect to these topologies. We get a local field, a periodic field, 
or the real numbers or the complex numbers. And if we are in a periodic case, we can look at, at the ring of integers, valuation ring, then we can look at the quotient modulo the maximal ideal and we come to the finite field. And the specific thing is that in Galois theory, we have a, a, an analogous hierarchy. You have a very big and complicated Galois group of a number field. A Galois group of Q is one of the most complicated objects we can think of. And when you go to the Galois group of the local field, how you get it? Uh, you just take, you take uh, 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 your valuation, you take one extension, it's not unity determined, but do not care, to the separable closure. Uh, you take all automorphisms of your field K, which are continuous with respect to the topology you get. This gives you a subgroup. And this is the Galois group of the local field. Now, this has a nice structure. Uh, in particular, there is a big quotient corresponding to the maximal unramified extension of this local field. This Galois group is generated by one element topologically. And this element corresponds to, in a canonical way, to the Frobenius automorphism of your finite field. So, you have the notion of Frobenius automorphisms in the Galois group of a number field by doing all this identification and take care of the fact that the Frobenius is determined only up to conjugation because of the choice of your extension of evaluation. And this is one of the key points uh, uh, which relates Galois theory with number theory. We have a local global principle uh, attached to an element in our Galois group, a characteristic polynomial, for instance, for uh, dimension two representation. It's clear that you have this one. And then de define uh, a, a representation is semi-simple if it is determined up to equivalence by the uh, set of all uh, characteristic polynomials. You know if you have a finite group and the group order is prime to the field you are looking uh, uh, at uh, to define the representation, you have a theorem of Maschke which tells you that always you have a, a simple sim uh, uh, representation. In general, this may not be true. Anyway, assume that you have such one, then Chebotarev's uh, density theorem tells you that this representation is determined just by looking at all the images of almost all the Frobenius elements you have. So it's a local global principle. If you know how the local groups act on your object, you know the whole action of the Galois group. What are elliptic curves doing in this environment? Now, number theorists are interested in elliptic curves over global fields. But global fields are embedded in the local ones. So, typical local one is are the complex numbers. Over complex numbers, and this is ex uh, historically where elliptic, uh, elliptic curves come from. Uh, we know elliptic curve it has an, an analytic structure. It is the uh, additive group C divided out by a two-dimensional lattice over Z. You have uh, normalization. You have the Weierstrass functions. And the normalization is that the lattice you look at is of this form with tau in the upper half plane. Then you have a function G, a modular function. And uh, if you take G of tau, then you just keep, get G of the elliptic curve you are begin with. So you see again what is the uh, structure of points of order n. But here, this is not so trivial. It, it's trivial uh, in our context, but we get immediately that uh, a string of endomorphisms of elliptic curves over fields of characteristic zero, we always have only commutative rings. Because it's so over complex numbers and every field can be embedded into the complex numbers if it's a finite type, so it's standard business. And you get 
that usually this ring of endomorphism is equal to z, just n times identity is all what you have as uh, endomorphisms, but sometimes you get special values of the g invariant at tau when this tau lives in an imaginary quadratic field and you have complex multiplication and you have uh, that g is an uh, algebraic integer and I think we will have a talk about this uh, theory which combines glass field theory with elliptic curves. Now let's go to uh, non archimedean valuations, you get periodic fields. There you can try to imitate the analytic theory. Sometimes this works very well, you come to the Tate curve, but all the time you get the following. If you go near enough in the topology you have to the zero point, then you always have kind of, log of, of p functions. And you get the theorem of Lutz, proved three times 25 years ago, <coughs> namely, that you always have a subgroup of finite index of this group of rational points on E which is isomorphic to OV. This tells you that the structure of, torsion po uh, of, of, of points on elliptic curves over local fields is a kind of very, very easy. For instance, you get that you have only finitely many rational torsion points. And uh, so, if you have a field of finite type over its uh, uh, prime field, then you get immediately that the torsion part of the rational point of elliptic curve is finite. But you can do better. You choose now very specific models, the narrow model, instead of taking any equation. This is adapted to the situation over the ring of integers of your valuation V. And then you have a classification. Uh, you get a group scheme over OV. This means you get a group scheme over the finite field, the residue field, and you can classify it. And if you look at it, it, it may not be connected. But if it is connected, uh, but it has a connected com component. And this is, again, an elliptic curve. You have good reduction, a multiplicative curve at least after a uh, quadratic extension, you have multiplicative reduction or split multiplicative reduction or the additive curve. Nothing else happens. And looking at uh, these conditions and the description of a model, you get a very, very nice uh, criterion of Neron, Org, and Shafarevich. An elliptic curve has good reduction if and only if the adjunction of all points of order n, where n has nothing to do with the characteristic of a residue field, is unramified. Elliptic curves over finite fields. This is a log, if you have it over, uh, if you have this reduction theory, okay, you are now curious what happens over the finite field. Uh, there, of course, we have only torsion points. Uh, we have a Frobenius automorphism as element in the Galois group. Now we have to, we, it, it induces an endomorphism on uh, the elliptic curve. And uh, it is not very difficult to see that the characteristic polynomial of this endomorphism can apply to Tate modules is the same for all else and is a polynomial in Z. This is not a deep theorem. So, we have this characteristic polynomial. Uh, we know about the determinant, so we have a Q there. And uh, because this is the, what the cyclotomic character does, it powers by Q. Uh, and we have this important trace of phi Q. And you see, the trace of phi Q determines everything. Uh, as a corollary, you get that you can compute the number of points on your elliptic curve over finite field FQ if you know the trace by this simple formula. The reason is 
that this endomorphism phi q minus identity is separable. And so the number you have here, which is the kernel of this map, uh, is the degree, and you can compute the degree, and this is linear algebra to get it. And not trivial is the result of TIT, namely that the isogeny class of an elliptic curve over a finite field is determined by the trace of a Frobenius. Now let's go slowly back to the global picture. We are used in number theory to have a global problem, go to the localization and do reduction and try to get information about the, local, the global piece by looking at the local pieces. Here we go once in the different direction. We try to get information by lifting. The key ingredient is of course Hans's lemma and it says that the points of order L, if L has nothing to do with the characteristic of uh, your ground field, uh, of uh, your residue field, they are the same as color modules over the local field and over the finite field. So you get the same representation. But it is not totally satisfying because it is, there is no uniqueness. Uh, you can lift, uh, you find many, many elliptic curves in tilde which go to E. Just a congruence model of the maximal ideal has to be satisfied. And we lift the automorphism of the Galois group as for Venus element and not the endomorphism of the elliptic curve. The big difference. And this is lifting the endomorphism is for an obvious reason not always possible. Because if we have super singular elliptic curves, we have non commutative endomorphisms. This is part of the work of Deuring in this uh, very, very beautiful and groundbreaking paper uh, über die Multiplikatorenringe uh, von elliptischen Kurven. Uh, and of course, we know that the endomorphisms are commutative in characteristic zero. So we never can lift the endomorphism of super singular uh, elliptic curves totally. But if we have an ordinary elliptic curve, then Deuring proved that uh, there is exactly one up to twist elliptic curve in tilde defined over a number field with, uh, with reduction E and with the same ring of endomorphisms. So especially the Frobenius endomorphism from the finite field lives in the ring of endomorphisms and we have E tilde has to be a, a, a curve with complex multiplication because this uh, Frobenius is not in Z. So we know about the ring of endomorphism there. We know that this Frobenius corresponds to uh, integer in uh, order of an imaginary quadratic field. And so we know that uh, the trace, the discriminant of our characteristic polynomial has to be negative because we get an imaginary uh, quadratic field. And so we have proved the Riemann hypothesis for elliptic curves. Namely, the number of points minus the number of points on the projected space is bounded by two times square root of Q and this defines the famous Hasse interval. So this is, you see, if you have a lifting theorem of Deuring, the Riemann hypothesis for elliptic curves is a triviality. Now, let's go back to global case. Uh, look at the field obtained by adjoining the points of order n of an elliptic curve. Of course, by reaction, we, by representation theory, we know the Galois group of this field is contained in the 2 by 2 matrices with entries over z mod n. We know that the n root of unity have to be inside of k and that if you go over this field adjoining n root of unity and take the Galois group of this one, we are in the special linear group. Now we have to distinguish two cases. First, we are in the complex multiplication case and then, and this is classically uh, Kronecker and Weber, so 1900 something already, another 
case of quadratic stream becomes true for imaginary quadratic fields, you get all abelian extensions by adjoining such g's and torsion points of a corresponding elliptic curves in a very explicit way. This gives class field theory in an explicit way of, of imaginary quadratic fields. Well, general case is that the endomorphism ring is equal to z. And then we have the famous theorem of Ser, namely for almost all numbers L, we have the image is as big as possible, namely GL2 Z mod L in the prime case, and then you see if you go up to L power N, you always get the full linear group. So we have now a method to create extension fields of the number field K in an explicit way by adjoining torsion points. And because of a criterion of Neron or Shafarevich, we have control about ramification. Look at the group of rational points. We know already torsion elements are finite in a finite group. And using the Hamid-Minkowski theorem, it says that for a given degree, there are only finitely many extensions of a number field which are unramified outside a given finite set. We get immediately that if you look at the group rational points modulo n times rational points for every number n, we get a finite group. OK, but we want more. And for this, we need a new ingredient, the neurotetide I mentioned in the very beginning. It is a positive definite quadratic form if we kill torsion by tensoring with R. It is defined locally, so it's a local geometric object. This is due to Neron. And it is uh, defined in an explicit way. This is due to Tate. One can compute it. And the nice thing is one can even do it in a uh, poor man's uh, manner. Namely, essentially, you have to compute the height of an x-coordinate of your uh, elliptic curve. And if you are over q and you have a point p, a divided by b and sub y, and a and b without common divisors, then the height is exactly the maximum of uh, log is missing. Excuse me. Log of its maximum, yeah? So the height is a logarithmic uh, object, and I forgot to put in here log. OK, excuse me. And having this and uh, the properties, it follows that EK is a finitely generated Z module. And if I cancel with R, it's a Euclidean space with respect to the uh, quadratic form neon tit height. And uh, the rank is called RE. Problem is to compute RE. Consequence, for a given finite set of places, there are only finitely, choose a biostatic equation. Look at affine uh, uh, points. Look at these points where the x coordinate has denominators uh, only in this finite set. Then you only get finitely many such points. This is Siegemahler theorem. So you do not have smooth points. Given the finite set, you have only finitely many points which have this smoothness condition. No smooth points. And even more, a conjecture of Lang, uh, another one I do not mention, is that the height of the points is not too small. It's bounded from below. And in fact, uh, Joe Silverman proved this for as a conjecture. Uh, smooth this for quite a lot of elliptic curves. So it follows, I said already, no infinite set of smooth elements and points with small height tend to be linearly independent because there is a bound from below for the height at all. You cannot combine, combine uh, small points with small height. OK, now let's come again to representation theory. L-series, we have the local information. And we can count with this local information the points modulo, point, uh, modulo 
valuations. We want to bring this together. And we just write down, yeah, we sample this. First of all, I should see here, uh, Faltings has proved that the tape model of a building variety is semi simple. It's a deep, deep theorem. Follows that two elliptic curves or abelian varieties are isogenous if their Frobenius elements coincide at enough places. It's an uh, effective version. And as consequence, you get models, Faltings got models conjecture. OK, this shows you how deep it is. Now, let's look what Hasse and Tanyama did. In fact, Tanyama may be Hasse. Uh, we want to link Galois theory with analytic functions. Uh, inspiring is the theory of L series of classical theory of L series of global fields. And here we use Eichler Shimura congruence and Langlands program. Let me state the things only for Q, for simplicity, for my time is uh, not infinite. Uh, we just write down at good primes the no, recently written down uh, characteristic polynomials of a Frobenius. And for bad primes, we define uh, special definitions depending on the type of reduction. Very easy recipe. Conjecture, maybe Hasse, it's not clear to me. I did not find any place. I can uh, tell a story afterwards if you want. And Taniyama. This function is a Dirichlet function, as one sees easily, converging for. Uh, uh, on, on, on the half plane uh, with uh, uh, in a real part larger than three half. Uh, this is an analyt uh, has an analytic continuation to the whole plane and satisfies a functional equation. It was proved by Doring for ACM curves or by Shimura for modular elliptic curves coming from x0. And now finally we are ready to s formulate the conjecture of Birch and Swindert and Dyer. Uh, I think Professor Birch can tell you better, but I have a feeling class number formula was somewhere behind. Um, yes, there was the Zeko formula for yeah. quadratic forms. The conjecture is, look at this analytic function. So first assume it is an analytic function. Secondly, take the R, R is a derivative normalized. Then the value at 1 is very explicitly given by an expression uh, which has easy parts, uh, namely torsion part. Then these are the number of connected components of a Nero model, more or less. Uh, this is the period, the real period. Here, this is already more complicated. We have a Euclidean space behind, and you take the uh, the, the, the volume of this, uh, this is a regulator in the case of number theory. And this here is a mysterious group, a Tejaferevich group. It is really uh, something new in the multiplicative group. You have no Tejaferevich group. You have a Hasse principle. And this measures the difference between uh, the truth of the Hasse, uh, how far the Hasse principle is not for satisfied. It should be a finite group. And we know a lot of cases that it is a finite group. But believe in this conjecture when it is a finite group. Define the Tejaferevich group by this formula. OK. Uh, if you want to compute, then the regulator is hard to be computed, and you need good bounds from below. I spoke about the Tejaferevich group already. Can go to the next slide. If we stay before 1985, then we have only one big theoretical result due to Cates and Wiles, namely the curves with CM and the value of L0 is not equal to 0 at 1. We have finiteness of a number of points. This is, I have already uh, spoken about uh, the importance of this conjecture. It's a central theme in arithmetic geometry nowadays. Next uh, conjecture, we have now that the L series is important. In the L series, we have the traces. How are they distributed? If I go over various P, and uh, 
This has to do with regression. What have we to expect as exact order? We know the value is in an interval. What is the exact order? Is this order a prime number? Or is it a smooth number? Both is important for cryptography or for uh, factoring numbers. And if we have complex multiplication, we have already theory of Deuring. We have that we are inside of a ring of integers of a magnetic quadratic field with Frobelius elements, and we have analytic number theory, which answers our questions. But what is if we are in a general case? When we look for the distribution, because of the Riemann hypothesis, we know that we can write the trace as 2 times square root p times a cosine s. Now we look at this angle theta p, and the conjecture is it is equally distributed with respect to a special measure. OK. Another question is, uh, can we say more can, uh, uh, given a number which satisfies some conditions? Is it true that we can count the number of p's such that the trace is exactly to this number? And Lang to say, yes, we can. There is a constant to be computed times square root t divided by log t, which gives this distribution. OK, a lot of conjectures till 85. Now, what comes past 85? A lot of theory, but very new ingredient. It was seen by these people mentioned in the announcement of a conference already, that these elliptic curves are eager beavers. If you want to factor number or if you want to give discrete logarithms and for prime number theorems. OK, so it becomes important to get explicit results. But first, let me show what are the big uh, theorems in theory. The biggest one is that Sayers conjecture is proved now. It means the following. Assume that you have any two-dimensional representation of a Galois group of Q going to a finite field, which is irreducible and odd. Then it is modular of a given level and a given weight. Consequences, Artin's conjecture for irreducible two-dimensional odd complex representation is true. Every elliptic curve is modular. This is Taniyama's conjecture. And as a footnote, you get Fermat's last theorem. So this is really down, 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 and uh, improved in five lines. Then there were results which were conditionally you, uh, for modular curves. They are now true. Korsagi, Kolivagin, Rubin. And finally, the Tate Shafarevich, uh, the Tate uh, Sato conjecture was proved in, uh, I think, nearly uh, totally uh, 2010. What has this to do with cryptography? We do not need all the deep theory, but we need astonishingly much of it. And the rest of the theory is to build up our confidence. We are in an area which is well understood, which is deep, and no one is allowed to come to this golden, to this garden. OK, I think what we should tell you for Neil Koblitz and Victor Miller, uh, one strong motivation to suggest elliptic curves as source for, source for DL was that there is no index calculus attack modeled after the one with a multiplicative group because we have the golden shield of heights. Look at the nice lectures and slides of uh, Koblitz ECC 2000. And the Xetni attack of Silverman was analyzed in this paper to be not effective. So this was for motivation. But when you have to construct fast construction, we have these distribution theorems. And they tell us, if we take a random curve, we have a good chance to get a strong curve. But to do, do it in really, one has to count points. And this is the next wave of application of arithmetic geometry. First was CM, till to be very efficient. But then came a targ homology by scale and in uh, using modular curves isogenies